sounding like an old time DJ at 1 o'clock, and it's almost time to rock. Uh, but I'm going to give it uh, just a few more minutes to let folks wander in. They're running a little behind. Uh, if you are, uh, if you're watching live on YouTube, then welcome. Thank you. Um, you can also join us uh, using or head to Palace.org, click on events, and still register and pop into the um, Zoom version of this. You can ask questions directly and things like that. But uh, yeah, glad everyone's here, and I will talk to you in just a few minutes. Hey everybody, all right, let's do this. Hi, my name is Nathan Smith and I'm the digital literacy specialist for the Central Arkansas Library System. Uh, I teach a bunch of technology classes, including, hey, this one. Um, and uh, I'm excited to have you here. This one, of course, is Fade In with Adobe Premiere. Um, <clears throat> so, um, just a couple of quick things to get out of the way before we dive in. First of all, um, we've got a lot of great uh, live virtual events coming up uh, here at the library. Um, during this time, we're trying to, uh, to do lots of cool stuff and to do it online. So you can, uh, so you can get there um, very easily. 
and uh, safely. So a few things coming up. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, next week, for one thing, uh, there is a juggling uh, tutorial event for kids. So um, if you uh, are interested in that, take a look at the website. It's cals.org and search for juggling up at the top. You can find that. Um, I've got a lot of great things happening, including uh, next week's tech chat event, where we're going to be uh, talking about working from home and just kind of an informal discussion type event rather than uh, rather than uh, an actual class like uh, what we're doing here today. Um, and our Six Bridges Book Festival is going all virtual this year. That's coming up in October. So keep an eye on the website for that. And if you wanna see all of the live virtual events we've got going on, the easiest way to do that is to head to cals.live. Just type that in your web browser and it'll show you a list of everything that's coming up soon, uh, at least everything we have on the website so far. Um, then uh, another big thing to say, I always like to encourage folks to ask questions throughout my classes. The point of technology classes is for attendees at the classes to learn stuff. And so if something's unclear or if there's a lingering question at the back of your mind, you won't learn as much. So ask questions anytime you have them throughout the session. Um, just use the chat um, in Zoom if you're not familiar. Um, you can go down to the bottom of your Zoom window and click chat and it'll open up uh, the chat box or put it on the side there for you. On a mobile device, you might need to tap the more button at the bottom of the screen to make the chat option visible, but you tap on that and then you send a little uh, message in text. Um, so I definitely wanna encourage you to ask questions as they come up. Um, and uh, if you're watching live on YouTube, you can also use the chat uh, down, below, um, down below the video to, uh, to ask questions there. Um, Last thing before we get rolling, please let me know in the chat if there are technical problems. Sometimes Zoom gets a little weird. And so uh, if you can't hear me, then please let me know as soon as possible. And uh, that way I can make sure that you don't miss anything and that I can go back and cover anything that you didn't quite catch. Um, Zoom doesn't really notify me if my mic stops working, but I'm unmuted. So, uh, so I really need y'all to let me know if there are technical problems. So that way we can make sure that, um, that, uh, that you get the most out of the class. So all of that being said, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> so let me fire up the old screen share here. Okay, cool. Oh, you know what? I probably need to do the thing where it says optimize screen sharing for video clip because, you know, we're going to be doing some things with video clips. Okay, cool. So uh, let's dive in. I've got uh, Premiere Pro open here in front of me. Um, and um, Premiere Pro, if you're not familiar, if this is your first time um, uh, learning about this stuff, Adobe Premiere Pro is part of the Adobe Creative Cloud suite. So um, that's, a, uh, that's a set of programs that are um, designed to, uh, to help you do creative work. Um, you know, a lot of creative professionals use these tools. And, um, and so you'll be, uh, or, and so uh, this is definitely a good thing to learn if you're thinking about doing video professionally or semi-professionally or making, you know, becoming uh, like a YouTube personality, any of those sorts of things. Um, you know, it's, it's good to, to learn the basics of video editing and Premiere is, um, is one of the best out there right now. It's got, um, it's got a lot of the professional features and, um, and so, um, so it's definitely a, um, uh, a good thing to learn about. If um, uh, it is a little expensive, so particularly um, if you're a student, I definitely recommend looking into the possibility of getting a student 
um, subscription for it, which is discounted, or if you're in some kind of nonprofit work, you might be able to get a discount um, on the subscription as well. Um, but uh, but it's uh, you know if you're doing this uh, if you're doing this for work or if you're doing this for um, something that's pretty rewarding, it, it may well be worth uh, the money because uh, it's really solid software all around. Okay, so um, the first thing that'll happen, if you haven't opened Premiere before, you may get a slightly different screen than what I have here. You may be prompted to, to do tutorials or something. What we're looking for is the option for a new project because we're gonna start with a, uh, a new project from scratch here. So go ahead and click new project wherever you might find that. If you don't find it anywhere in the middle of the screen, you can also always click file and then new project. Or if you're on a Mac, you can click the, um, uh, I guess you would still click file up there at the very, very tippy top of a Mac. Um, and then uh, it's going to ask us uh, to decide on where, to decide where we want our project. So our project file in Premiere is gonna be, um, is gonna be a file, but it's gonna be associated with a lot of other files. So it's gonna be really a whole folder that we need. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm uh, that I'm in the right spot. I'm going to click Browse here, go to my desktop, and I'll just go ahead and create a new folder. So I'm going to right-click somewhere in this blank area, go to New, and click Folder, and I'll call this one, you know, Premiere Eight. Whoops, <laughs> Eight Thirteen. So that way. I know what it is and I can get rid of it afterwards because I don't necessarily need to keep this project long term. Select folder. And so now it's going to store it in that particular folder uh, on my desktop, excuse me, in this case. And then I actually need to name my project. So I'm just going to call it Premiere Demo 813. Good, good, good. Okay. So all this other stuff, we can usually safely ignore. Premiere will pick up on the information that uh, you need. And in most cases, the default settings here are fine. Um, but I do want to talk briefly about these other two tabs here. There's a Scratch Disks tab. The Scratch Disks tab um, chooses where, uh, allows you to choose where you want your stuff to be stored. In this case, it looks like it's actually set as custom this time, which is not what I want. The default should be same as project, and that's typically what you want. You want the, the full, or you typically want all of these other bits of little files that are associated with your project to be stored in the same place that your project file is. Um, and then in just settings here, um, this is so. Premiere, like most video editing software, is nonlinear non-destructive editing. Let's talk about both of those in turn. Non-linear editing means that you can edit your video in any order. You don't have to worry so much about, okay, this happens and then this happens and then this happens and doing it in that order. You can edit the very end of the video first and then you can go back to the beginning and then you can tackle the middle somewhere in there and um, you know do it however you need. So you don't have to worry about, um, about putting things exactly in order until, you know, the end when, hey, uh, you'll be putting things in order because it's kind of what editing is. Um, but it's also non-destructive. Non-destructive basically means that whenever you're, um, whenever you're working with, with uh, what we call assets inside of Premiere, so things like uh, your video files, uh, any audio recordings, um, images, all of those sorts of things. Whenever you're working with any of that stuff, uh, at the end of the day, your project is not really a, your project file is not really gonna be, um, you're not gonna be changing the, the original files as you edit. So even if I cut, you know, 10 minutes off of uh, you know some particular video clip that I'm using in my uh, in my video. That doesn't mean that I'm gonna lose that that part of the video. 
that part of the video is still there. The entire file that I started with is still there, but uh, I'll need to, or, but um, it's, but Premiere is just kind of queuing up the bits of it that I need, almost like a stage director uh, in a play, you know, that person would be backstage going, okay, you know, now you're on. Um, in the same way, your Premiere, um, you know, your Premiere project file basically says, okay, I need this much of this clip, and then I need this particular section of this clip, and then I need this section of this clip over here, and let's play that audio file while that's going, and, you know, so on and so forth. So it's just queuing things up using your, um, your files as, as source material to create a final video file that you'll then distribute. Um, and we'll talk about that process. That's the process that we're going to be following. Um, so because Premiere is uh, non-destructive, uh, when you bring in your files, it'll be sort of pointing to them. This ingest settings thing then is important because if you leave this ingest checkbox unchecked, what'll happen is wherever your files are on your computer, when you bring them in, bring them in to your Premiere project, they'll stay there exactly where they were. And as long as those files stay in the same folder uh, on your computer and whatever storage device those files are stored in stays connected to your computer, then uh, you'll be able to use it. But if those files move somewhere else, if you're bringing in files from say an SD card that you had in your camera or things like that, um, then you may not want to use, or you may want to use this ingest because what that's gonna, or because that will actually make copies of the file uh, that, that will be stored with your project or wherever you designate in this scratch disks area um, that I showed you a moment ago. It'll make copies of the files. So that way all your stuff's in one place and you don't have to worry about um, if you're clearing out your downloads folder someday, uh, you know, losing the footage that's part of your project. Um, so copy does ex just exactly that. It copies the files and does nothing else with them. You also have a few other options here, transcode. If you choose transcode, what it's going to do is it's going to, for each file that you bring into your project, it's going to convert it into a specific format um, that'll be stored some, or that'll be stored again, probably with your project, wherever your scratch disks are located. Um, if, you have a, if you have a type of file that your computer isn't good at handling, uh, isn't good at handling efficiently, you could transcode into a different type of file and your computer might be able to work a little more efficiently with that. Uh, and that could be helpful in terms of editing. And it'll also save you time at the end of your project uh, when you export your files. There's also create proxies and copy and create proxies. Proxies are a, um, they're a stand-in for your footage. So if you have really nice high resolution, like 4K footage or something that you've shot, um, you, you probably don't wanna edit with that raw footage because if you do, your computer is gonna bog down when you're editing and it's gonna be harder to, to work with. Um, so if you, uh, so what you can do is you can create proxies. Proxy files are basically low resolution versions of your video that you can use for editing. But then when, the comp or when you go to, uh, to export your final product, the, um, uh, the computer says, oh, or the computer goes back to your original source files and says, hey, you know, let's, or, and gives you the full resolution version. So you can edit efficiently, but then uh, you get high quality at the end of the road. And then last but not least is copy and create proxies. Copy and create proxies creates copies of the original files with your, along with your project, and then creates proxies for you to use in editing as well. I'm gonna uncheck all of these for now because I don't need them, but uh, I did wanna show you that because that's some useful stuff that can save you a lot of time. I'm gonna click okay and we're going to get into Premiere proper. Okay, here we are. We're inside of our project file right now. 
and um, and uh, I'm gonna show you the lay of the land kind of as we work. So that way you know, our, so that way we're kind of building on things gradually. Um, the first thing that I wanna do, as I mentioned previously, is I want to import my footage. I wanna bring in the footage so that, uh, so that I can start working with it. Uh, you probably saw on the little intro graphic at the beginning of the class, um, or uh, if you registered ahead of time, you may have received an email as well um, to tell you how to get a hold of the um, of the example footage that we're using. If uh, you know, if you didn't, uh, if you didn't see any of that, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, there are links to those files at cals.click, C-A-L-S dot click slash Premiere files, uh, so you can uh, you can head to that uh, and download the example files to follow along with me and uh, as we're going, or you can just watch and follow along later. As I said, this is being streamed live to YouTube, so uh, so you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to check it out later as well on the Cal's YouTube channel uh, if you want to just watch for now and then practice later on. Perfectly fine. But uh, okay, so I've got the footage um, uh, on my computer ready to go. Uh, and I'm gonna start importing that. I could do this a couple of different ways. One way is I can right click here and I can click import in this corner area here, what we call the project panel. The Premiere window is divided up into these different sections called panels. And when I click in one, you'll notice it highlights blue around it. That'll be important later. Um, for now, I could right click in the, pro in the project panel and I could click import, or if I prefer, I can open up my, uh, my computer's file explorer and I, can, uh, and I can drag stuff in and that'll work as well. So I'm gonna start with, this is the, uh, the folder that, um, well, it was created from the zip file that I downloaded from Adobe's website. One of the things about this too, if you go to that cals.click slash premiere uh, files, you'll get a link to Adobe's website to download the video footage. And there's actually a whole tutorial project that you can follow along with using this footage um, and uh, kind of take your time on it. Um, so that's definitely something that, uh, that you can do if, um, you know, if you want a little more practice uh, and you don't even have to download the footage again now. Uh, so I'm going to double click on this video footage folder to open it up. And I've got 19 files in here, dg underscore hoverboard underscore 001.mxf. I'm going to drag a box around these. So I'm holding down the mouse button and dragging over. Or you can click the first one, hold shift. And while you're holding shift, click the last one. Either way works perfectly fine. Um, we just want to get all of these files. And then I'm going to drag them over and drop them on top of the project panel right here. And now everything's being imported. Because of the settings that I'm using on my copy of Premiere, uh, you'll notice it did create additional um, files whose names end with .xmp next to these. Those are metadata files that are useful to, um, to Premiere and also to other Adobe programs. So, um, Excuse me. So, uh, so that's something that um, you know. Don't worry about that. If you see that, that's normal. Okay. So now I have a big long list of stuff here. These are my actual video files that I downloaded from the Adobe site. Um, uh, the way that I have mine set up right now, it's just a big list. If I want a little more detailed previews, though, I can come over here and. Um, I can, uh, I can change my view by clicking this icon view button down at the bottom. When I do, now I can see each of these clips um, and I can even move my mouse over them to get a brief little preview of them. That's pretty cool. Uh, so let's take a look at, hmm. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pick number 16 this time. This guy kind of like spirals up in the air. Um, 
and then I'll double click on this. And that's gonna take us to a new panel on the screen here. This is called the source monitor panel. So there are two monitor panels that we're gonna deal with during class, um, the source monitor panel and the program monitor panel. And they do slightly different things. So, um, so I definitely, um, or so uh, we'll talk a little bit about each, but they're pretty similar to be honest. The source monitor panel though shows you individual assets. In this case, the video clips that we have, it shows you individual pieces of media um, like video clips, images, audio files, whatever, um, so that you can essentially take a look at your raw materials and see what bits you wanna use. Um, and so uh, when I double click on something down in the project panel, that particular asset opens up in the source monitor panel. Um, and because it's called the source monitor panel, it's a monitor. So you can see the, um, you can see the information that's in your, um, uh, or you can see uh, what's on, or you know, what's in that particular clip or whatever. So uh, let's do a little playback. Let's watch this clip. So I have a little playhead down here, um, uh, this little blue arrow thing. By the way, the playhead will start um, when you're down here in the source monitor panel, if I move back and forth, you'll notice that there's this little, little tiny gray dot that's scrubbing along this blue line. And as I move my mouse back and forth, I can scrub through the clip without even opening it up. If I double click uh, on, on the clip in this, uh, you know, down here in the project panel, whichever frame I'm looking at in the preview here is gonna be the frame that I'll start at up in the source monitor panel. So I started out at frame number 20, I think when I double clicked on this, that was because that was where I had scrubbed to um, when I opened this up. Okay, so I can drag this playhead around using the mouse, of course. Um, and I can, uh, and I can play the way I usually play clips is using the space bar. Um, so hit space bar, see them sort of rise up into the air and come down. Pretty cool. Um, and then, uh, and then I can, uh, I can scrub along here using the mouse to get wherever I want to be. Uh, I can also move from frame to frame. So really the best way to do that usually is by using the keyboard. You have the little arrow keys on the keyboard, up, down, left, and right. Everybody knows those. Um, and I can use the left arrow key to go back a frame, or I can use the right arrow key to go forward a frame. By the way, if you're not familiar with the terminology, I do wanna clarify that. When we say a frame, in video or film world, what we're talking about is one still image, essentially. So in this case, um, so because of course, as I'm sure everybody uh, who's watching already knows, uh, video content is just a series of still images that are flashed on a screen fast enough that it gives your eye the illusion of movement. So, um, uh, so each still image that makes up that sequence of images that are a video um, or a film, that those are frames. And that comes from, if you look at a piece of film, uh, it literally has frames uh, for each still image that makes up the moving picture that you ultimately see on the screen. Um, the time here, uh, you know, if you look over here, this is where it says the playhead position here. Um, that's what we call time code. So this is gonna count off um, a number of frames, a number of seconds, a number of minutes, and a number of hours. So right now I'm at 16 frames, zero minutes, zero, or yeah, zero seconds, zero minutes, and zero hours. Uh, if I slide forward, now I'm at one second and 13 frames, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. The important thing to bear in mind about this is the number of frames that are showing up on the screen 
or that are um, that show up on screen at any given time um, is what we call the frame rate. So in this case, with this footage, you'll notice if I go down to now I'm at exactly one second. If I go down one more frame from that or back one more frame from that, I'm at 23 frames all the way back. If I go all the way back to zero frames. So this footage is shot in uh, at a what we call a frame rate of 24 frames per second. Um, so for every second of video footage, we have 24 still images that are flashing up on the screen to give us this, um, you know, to show us this, uh, this movement that the camera captured. Your footage may run at a different frame rate. Um, the standard 24 frames per second, like this footage is the standard for, for film, like uh, a movie that you might actually see in the theater. Um, 20 or um, that's the standard frame rate for film um, for TV, at least here in the United States, the standard frame rate is 30 frames per second. In Europe, it's 25. Um, for video games, the desired minimum frame rate is about 60 frames per second, and that's inching up um, to 120 and even higher sometimes. Um, some filmmakers have experimented with shooting movies at higher frame rates. People don't tend to like that though. It makes it seem a little too real and, um, and kind of uh, unpleasant uh, from what I understand. I haven't actually seen a high frame rate movie in, in a theater. But, um, uh, but also, by the way, if you notice that movies don't look nearly as good on your TV as they should, like they, they kind of have this soap opera look to them or, um, or, um, they f or um, something just feels off when you're watching a movie on your TV, uh, there's a setting in some TVs uh, that's known as motion smoothing. What it does is it tries to add in more frames to your video um, as you're watching it. Usually when a filmmaker makes some, some kind of film or video content, they've shot it in a specific frame rate for a specific reason. So if you turn that um, motion smoothing off, uh, then you're gonna get a more cinematic feel as you watch your movie. So um, it's a little tip to improve your home theater uh, experience. Anyway. Excuse me. All right, so a um, few other things to talk about with this source monitor panel. So we've got our play and pause, which we can do with the space bar or by clicking the play button down here. We've got our frame moving frame by frame, which can be the left or right arrow keys or these little buttons right here. The next set of buttons working out from the play and pause button is the uh, go to in and go to out buttons. Um, for each, or as you're editing your video clips, you're gonna find that there are bits of the clips that you're just not gonna use. Um, and that's perfectly fine, that's normal. Uh, like for instance here, it kind of like the person suddenly zooms out and it just looks a little weird and it's sideways. So I don't love that. So uh, this would probably be the last frame of footage that I would use from this particular clip. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit, uh, I'm gonna mark an out point for this clip. Um, you can do it by hitting this little curly brace right here and clicking that under the source monitor panel, or you can press the O key on your keyboard. O is an Oscar. Okay, so that is my, so that's my out point. You'll notice there's a gray area here. Um, that's where, that's the, this is the part of the clip that I don't want to use. So, um, so that's, uh, that's not shaded in. Uh, and all the rest of this is pretty good. Uh, if I wanted uh, to, I, though, I could also mark an end point by pressing I on my keyboard or hitting this left sort of curly brace over here. Let's say I want to use this to start out my, um, my video. 
I'm going to come up here and I'm going to hold down. I can just hold down on the video itself, with the mouse and drag it down. And I'm going to drop uh, the um, right here. So I'm going to drag down and drop right here in the timeline. <clears throat> um, so this is the timeline panel. And basically the idea with this is you can, um, you can use it to, um, uh, you can use this to, well, to, to lay out your video visually exactly the way, you know, sequence everything exactly the way you want it to be. Um, there's a few, there are a few controls over here that are not super duper interesting. Uh, so we won't, uh, we won't necessarily dwell on those. Um, and in fact, yeah, we'll wait a few minutes to talk about uh, some of this stuff because it'll be more relevant once we've, uh, once we've got a few clips in our timeline here. So right now, here's the one clip that I have, dg underscore hoverboard underscore 016 dot mxf. You'll notice there are two different little bars here. Um, this top one represents the video portion of the clip. Um, the bottom one represents the audio portion of the clip. Uh, and it's worth noting that with these particular clips, we don't have any audio component to them. Excuse me. So, um, so if you, so um, even though there's an audio track, there's like a space for audio, essentially, there's no actual recorded audio. So it's just a blank, um, it's just silence, basically. So we could remove that or we could ignore it. Or if I wanted to grab just the clip and not the, the audio at all, even if it had real audio attached to it, rather than go from here, from, from the actual frame itself, I can come down here and find this little film strip and drag that into my timeline. And then it only gives me the video portion. So that could be useful. Anyway, I'm gonna undo that for the moment. <clears throat> okay, so also, in addition to uh, the, the clip showing up on my timeline, I can, now see, uh, I can now see some video up here in this other monitor panel. This is the program monitor panel. And this is a panel that shows me, um, that shows me how my final product is shaping up, more or less. So, um, <clears throat> so if I want, I can, um, uh, um, I can use that to, um, so, oh, you know what? I just noticed a chat message. Uh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see that until now that said the screen was blurry. Is it, uh, is it still looking blurry or is everything good now? Okay, cool. Um, I don't know why that is. Uh, that's very strange. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, oh, that's very odd. Um, <clears throat> I wonder, okay, I'm gonna try to, uh, I'm going to try to turn off the thing that says optimize screen sharing for video clip. Maybe it's talking about essentially prioritizing a frame rate over, um, over visual quality. We don't necessarily need to, uh, to worry about that. Um, so maybe, maybe this will do the trick. Okay. All right. Excellent. That's, uh, all right. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> So that's what we needed to do. All right, so I've got my uh, I've got my one clip here on the timeline so far, and I've got my um, and I have my program monitor panel up here. That's going to show me that's going to show me my uh, my clips, or that's going to show me my final product or a preview of my final product. Um, so that I can get a feel for how my editing is working. Editing is one of those things that's like um, that, where it makes a big difference um, 
how your um, it makes a big difference how your um, you know timing is key to editing, and uh, so you want to make sure that you're that you're not uh, focused on. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not worried uh, that that uh, things happen at the right time and that that what you're doing really uh, really works and feels like it should and uh, and so um, so it's it's important to, uh, to to get a feel for how everything's shaping up and what the pacing is like and things like that um, you know one of the one of the hallmarks of bad editing is the pacing is inconsistent. And so, um, so keeping a pace and having a flow is, uh, is really useful. Speaking of which, uh, let's go ahead and throw some audio in here. I'm gonna open up my little um, thing here. I've got my, um, my song that I'm going to be using. I'm not going to be using the song that came with the um, with the um, with the footage that I downloaded from Adobe because I'm not sure about the the whole rights situation with uh, with the song. Um, so instead, I'm going to use the one that I linked to uh, in the you know uh, in the download area called Staccato by. Uh, group or a person called the vibe tracks. Um, and that's a free attribution free um, piece of, uh, of music. So, uh, so you can use that in your own work. I got it from the YouTube um, audio library. If you're ever looking for stock music, that's one really nice place to look is that YouTube video lib or audio library. Um, Cause they have a bunch of stuff that you can use for free without worrying about rights and royalties and um, all of that sort of thing. So uh, I've got that. I dragged it over to import that into my uh, my project, and now I'm going to click over here, and I'm going to drag it uh, into my timeline. Now that I have a timeline, I can't quite just drop it anywhere um, like I did with the first clip. I now need to position it in a specific spot, which frankly is fine because that's you know that's something that you need control over, um, and so. I'll drag it over here on the, so your timeline is basically divided up into two parts. The top part is uh, you have these video tracks right here, um, V1, V2, and V3. And the bottom part is audio tracks. You can always add more tracks if you need them. You can just right click and click, you know, um, or no, excuse me, where? There we go. Okay, can't right click there, but I can click, right click over here and click add track. Um, and since I'm clicking in the audio area, that'll add an audio track. You can have as many tracks as you want, basically. Um, you know, you'll, it will get confusing long before you, uh, long before you hit the limit of number of possible tracks. Um, and your computer will slow down too. Um, so you don't need a lot of tracks usually, uh, but, but it's helpful sometimes. Uh, a lot of times, uh, for example, you can put music on one track, sound effects on another track. If you're doing something where there's dialogue, particularly dialogue with multiple people, you can have like a dialogue track for, you know, Josephine and the dialogue track for Kevin or whatever. Um, so that way you can, uh, you can dig in or, you know, that way you can adjust people's levels independently and, um, you can put audio from different sources on different tracks, things like that. So it's really, really useful with the audio. Um, with the video, you only need a certain number of tracks. And I, I've probably gone to five tracks on video before, but that's about it. Um, you could do many more though, if you wanted to. We'll talk about how those tracks work together here in a sec. For now though, I've got my audio down here at the bottom. I've I dragged it off to the very left here because that's the beginning of my video. So now when I watch this, you can actually hear the music along with the, um, watching the video. So I can kind of see like if everything's paced correctly. And actually that works really nicely. Um, 
So let's find some other clips to throw in here. Okay. We've got that guy going there. Let's see. What about this one's a little bit different. That's kind of fine. Okay, this one here, number 10, I'm going to double click on that and we'll check that out. One other way that you can watch video uh, with this that I highly recommend um, is uh, you can use what's called the shuttle uh, option here. So on your keyboard, if you look at it, the J, K, and L keys are right next to each other. Back in the day when folks would edit video using, um, uh, when folks would edit video using actual tapes, um, the tape decks for editing often contained what's called a shuttle wheel. Basically, it looked like, you know, if you've looked at a, um, at a big uh, stereo system or, you know, uh, audio receiver, uh, if you look at those things, uh, a lot of times the volume knob on those is giant. It's like this big. And a shuttle wheel looked very similar to that. Um, but instead of you turn it to turn the this, you know, to the right to turn the volume up and you turn it to the left to turn the volume down, instead, it had a little mark on the top of the wheel. If you turned it left or right uh, and then you let go of the wheel, it would snap back to the middle. Um, and that was designed to control playback. So if you turn the wheel just a little bit to the right, then it would play the video, but it would play it very slowly. The further you turn the wheel to the right, the faster the video would play back. And if you turned it all the way to the right, it would, turn, it would play super duper fast. But as soon as you let go of the wheel, the video would stop. So all you would need to do would be to, or you know, so as you're, so you can use that to really quickly scrub through your footage and find the exact spot that you need at a speed that works well for you. Um, and if you wanted to go backward, all you need to do instead of turning the wheel to the left or to the right, you turn it to the left. So with Premiere, it has a shuttle option as well. Basically what you do is um, you can just rest your fingers on J, K, and L. And if you press the L key, it's gonna play your footage back at normal speed. If you hit the K key, it'll stop the footage wherever it is right then. If you press the J key once, it'll run your footage, footage backwards at normal speed. Excuse me. If I press the L key twice, then it's gonna go double speed. Press it again, it'll go even faster for this since it's such a short clip. Uh, it's, it's hard to really show off how useful this is, but I can use this to, um, but I can use this to scrub backwards and forwards really fast if I want to, to get to exactly the spot that I need. And as soon as I see the bit that I need in the video, I just hit the K key and then I'm good to go. So essentially hitting the L key once goes, goes normal speed, hitting it again goes faster, hitting it again goes even faster, hitting it again goes even faster. So you can use that to just blast through a, um, uh, you know, um, oops, somehow I added something in there, whoops. Okay, there we go. You can use it to, to just blast through footage really quickly and find exactly the spot that you need. And that's beautiful. Okay, so, um, and then uh, once you find the, the bit that you need, you just hit the K key and then you can, uh, and that, that will stop you exactly where you are. So I find that really useful. Um, you know, using the arrow keys, you only get one frame at a time. So it can be pretty laborious. And of course, you don't always know exactly where the spot is that you need in your clip. So the shuttle option is really nice that way. Anywho, okay, let's check out this clip. So with this clip, he goes up, splashes down. Okay, he does that a couple of times. So honestly, we can use this whole clip. Uh, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna drag it over here and drop it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag it close to the clip that I already have on my timeline and then drop it right there. You'll notice there's like a little line that lights up right there and the, the clips are right next to each other. So if I drop it here, 
there it is. Now I can watch the portion of this first clip that I used, and then. Um, and, uh, and so, so we use that whole clip, although we'll probably split it up later on. Um, so let's see. All right. Uh, let's throw something else in here. This one's fun. Okay. This one's number 13. He revs up and then hits a point here. Let's just watch it at regular speed. And then, whoops, and then he starts to weave back and forth and then strikes a cool pose at the end. That's pretty fun. Um, <clears throat> so we probably don't need all this rev up right here. So I'm gonna find kind of the part where he starts to, starts to come out of the water here-ish. And I'll mark that as my in point. So again, I'm going to hit I on my keyboard to mark my in point. And then he does strike a cool pose, but it's right at the end of the clip. So we would have to just cut away directly after that. We're not going to, um, yeah, we'll just leave it there for now. OK, that's good. So because this is a clip with no audio, eh, no, I'll just grab the whole thing. There we go. Drop it in there again behind this. There's another way to, to, to drop these clips into the timeline. You can drop them into the timeline wherever your playhead is um, by using the keyboard. And so if you're assembling a bunch of things really quickly, that could, uh, and you've, you've basically marked your in and out points beforehand on everything, that's super duper, like that's a, that's an easy way to get your timeline really like put together very quick, uh, quickly. Um, and that's so, and you can also use these buttons to do the same thing. The insert key, uh, the insert keyboard shortcut. So basically wherever the playhead is, it'll split everything on the timeline um, to before this clip and after this clip. Um, the insert keyboard shortcut is comma. The overwrite keyboard shortcut, where it'll just drop it in there. And if there's something to the right of the playhead, that thing will just be um, recorded over, basically, at least for the timeline's purposes. Um, that uh, you can press period to do that. And of course, if your playhead is at the end, uh, you know, uh, of the timeline on the last frame of the previous thing or whatever, um, then just using either one is is fine. Although I'd probably actually I'd probably use overwrite because insert will actually split this audio as well. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we've got that. Let's add in one more. This time, I'm gonna get this guy who's shooting video of these people and laughing. That's pretty fun. Um, adds a nice little color. I'm just going to take this clip whole. I'm not even going to fool with in points and out points for this right now. Okay, so I've got a few clips on my timeline. Let's talk about some of what's going on here um, with the timeline. First of all, let's talk about these settings over here on the left of the, of the tracks. Again, we're not going to cover all of these settings because they're a little fiddly. And to be honest, some of this stuff as someone who uses this software practically every day, um, I still haven't found like some of this stuff incredibly useful. So I don't think you will certainly starting out uh, with Premiere. So we'll kind of ignore some of it, but there is some really useful stuff here. Over here on the left are these little locks. So you can use the locks to lock a particular track so that changes can't be made to it. In this case, we've got our music in place and we're basically creating a music video. So there's really no reason for us to change where the, the audio is or really do anything with it at all. Um, so I'm actually gonna click the little lock right here and you'll notice I get some cross hatching here above the, uh, the, audio, um, above the audio track. So that way I know like this track's locked 
nothing's going to happen to it. If I try to make any changes to it, it'll just kind of blink at me. Um, and so that really helps, um, you know, if you've got something exactly the way you want it, lock that track and then you're good to go. Just make sure there's nothing else you want to change on the track, obviously. Um, we'll skip over a few of these. Okay. These are also quite useful. Mute and solo. So the mute button obviously is exactly what it sounds like. Excuse me, if I've got one particular audio track where um, that I don't need to deal with right now, um, it's just getting in the way, uh, you know, or it sounds bad and I need to tweak it later.
Okay. Hmm. Well, try one more time. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Magically, it's better. So now we can sort of see like, okay, we're uh, how we're fading in. If I want to, I can adjust these keyframes. So I could, if I want it to fade in a little longer, I can move this keyframe over to the right a little bit. And now it'll take 20 frames rather than 12 for it, for the video to fade in. So it'll come in uh, a little more gradually. Uh, I could set multiple keyframes if I want it to be at say 80% by this particular frame. I'll set another keyframe there by clicking the button and I'll just change this to 80. So now it'll come in a little more gradually and then it will, it'll be pretty bright by this point and then, um, and come in and sort of be more gradual uh, over the next few. Um, and then you can even change what kind of keyframe they are so that it does it, you know, it'll kind of follow different curves and things like that, but mm, that's probably not something we need to get into at the moment. Let's try another thing with effects here. So let's say that, um, let's say that I wanna kind of cross, uh, sort of uh, cross fade or cross dissolve between these two pieces of footage right here to make it a little more kind of dreamy like. Um, I can do that by using effects over here in, in, the, uh, in the effects panel. Up here at the top, if I wanted to search for a particular thing, I can. So I can click here and I can do a little search um, and it'll filter down. Or I can go down here under this video transitions folder, click on that, click the little arrow, and I'll click dissolve. And there's cross dissolve right there. So there's the different categories here, presets, so you can save certain certain settings with your effects. That's pretty useful sometimes um, so that you can apply the same, the same effect with the same settings over and over again. Lumetri presets, Lumetri is the color, uh, is the, uh, the color, um, uh, what they call color, color correction and color grading um, uh, part of Premiere, which we're not gonna get into um, today but you can change that, um, but you can have specific presets for that. Audio effects and audio transitions, video effects and video transitions. Audio effects and video effects are gonna be things that are ongoing throughout the whole clip um, or throughout part of a clip, but not necessarily starting or stopping with the clip itself. Video and audio transitions are how you move between different um, pieces of video or pieces of audio. Um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is find the cross dissolve right here. So I'm going to drag that down and I'm going to drop it on this edit point between this clip and this one. I can put it in the middle here. I can put it over on this side or I can put it over on this side. And I'll show you what that does in a second. I'll put it in the middle for now. So when I play this, it fades out of the one and fades into the other like so. If I move it, so it's centered at a different point, I can move it all the way over here so that it starts dissolving away from this guy really early and comes into this um, <clears throat> and comes into this so that by the time we hit that edit point, we're in the, the part of the clip that I had already picked out. Or we can essentially start to dissolve at the edit point and then continue to transition over to this other one as this clip's already in progress. So you can do it either way. The only difference is you do need some extra footage on either side. If, if you've got two little triangles at the top and bottom of these, the cross is all won't work properly because it's, it needs frames to display as it's transitioning from both, uh, from both clips. Um, <clears throat> So let's see. Um, I guess the last bit here is, uh, you know, if you, once you kind of watch through things and you're happy with what you've got, um, then uh, the last part is exporting. That's kind of the, um, that's the other big, uh, the other big portion of this that you definitely want to uh, be mindful of. 
Because once you've created this, basically what you have is a list of cues. Okay, this clip starts here and this clip starts here and I want this audio to start in this section and end uh, you know, at this point and so on and so forth. You have a bunch of cues and you have a bunch of media files that are stored on your computer. But obviously in order to get this video out to someone else, you're going to need to, um, you're going to need to, uh, to, to package it all into one file that you can then upload to YouTube or send to your friends or whatever you are wanting to do with it. Um, okay, we got our audio back working. That's great. Okay, so um, in order to make a version of this that uh, that I can post on YouTube or do whatever I need to with it, uh, I will need to export. What I'm going to do is. Um, this is kind of a weird thing that I noticed over time. I hadn't really run into this problem before. Sometimes I noticed that if I went up to file and clicked and went over to export and I clicked on the right option, that it wouldn't actually do anything. When you do this, you need to have either your timeline or your source monitor panel selected in order to export your final version of your video. Um, one of those two needs to be selected. So either way, I'm going to select that, make sure that it's highlighted. Oh, by the way, if you ever need to see a more detailed view of a particular panel, it's super easy to do that. This is one of my favorite keyboard shortcuts. I can't believe I almost let you go without telling you this. Um, you can expand the panel to be almost full screen by selecting it and pressing the tilde key on your keyboard. Tilde is the little squiggly thing. On most keyboards, it's underneath the escape key, ESC. Um, but if I hit the tilde key, uh, since I had the timeline selected, it's going to expand the timeline to take up my whole um, to take up my whole screen. Basically, if I hit it again, it'll reduce it back down to what it normally was. So if you want to see your video nice and big when you're kind of doing a final preview, select that program monitor panel and then uh, hit tilde. <laughs> And then you can squish it back down into the regular size uh, when you need to do something else. So anyway, tilde the key, very cool keyboard shortcut. Okay, so I've got this all, I've got this selected. I'm gonna go up to file here and I'm gonna head to export. And then I'm gonna click on media. When I do that, it's going to come up with this little export media dialog box. It's pretty huge because it has a bunch of different things going on. We're not going to talk about all of them, but, um, but it's worth talking about them in a little bit of detail. Okay, so over here on the left-hand side, uh, I've got a little, I have another sort of monitor panel. Um, and this allows me to preview my video one final time to make sure everything looks good. I can also say which parts of the timeline I want to export. So I know that I only have video out to like this far. I'll even use the arrow keys and get to exactly the last frame. There it is. So I can take these little triangles down here underneath this blue timeline and I can drag that in so that I get only the portion uh, that I actually want. So if I have more stuff on my timeline than can actually or than I actually want in my video, I can choose the section of video that I want. That's kind of nice. Um, most of the time though, you probably won't have that. You'll probably cut everything before you get to this, uh, you know, cut off the the last bits or whatever before you even get to this export point. Next thing that I want to do is look at these export settings up here. So the export settings, uh, give me a whole host of honestly very confusing options, um, but I want to show you some of the, the basics here. So um, the, uh, you know, if you are, if you're working on some sort of platform where they've said, okay, we need video in a specific format, then you can usually find that format up here at the top by clicking this drop down box. Uh, next to where it says format there. 
you can pick one of these options, whichever one they wanted, um, to select sort of the general format that the um, file format specifically that they want the um, that they want your final product in. Um, if you don't have a specific choice in mind, then uh, my suggestion personally is the HEVC codec. HEVC stands for High Efficiency 